All right, well, let's open to Acts chapter 4 then. Acts chapter 4, the first arrest and inquisition of the apostles here at Pentecost. I'm going to say a prayer before we start teaching. Lord, we thank you for the glory that you have promised us and your son, Jesus Christ, and uh, the hope of uh, a promised inheritance that we have with you forever. Help us to set our affections on those things tonight as we study your word and as we try to learn from it, the boldness here that uh, you gave the apostles as they stood before the rulers and leaders of their day uh, to preach uh, your name. And I pray that we would have that same boldness to preach the mystery of the gospel. Amen. Okay, Acts chapter 4. We finished last week in chapter 3 where Peter uh, made his appeal to the nation of Israel to repent uh, because they had crucified their Messiah. And then after they repented, the times of refreshing would come. The times of restitution would come from the presence of the Lord. So their teaching was you killed the, the prince of life, you killed the, the Christ, you need to repent, and then the kingdom will come. Christ will return and the kingdom will be set up. That was the condition. And he proved Jesus was the Christ by the miracles that they saw with their eyes. Not something you could preach today. Nobody today has seen Christ perform a miracle in person. It just hasn't happened. Okay, uh, but these folks did. They could not deny them. We'll see it again tonight that even the leaders in Israel could not deny the miracles that were being performed. Uh, so they appealed to that. But, they, but more importantly than what they just saw, Peter appealed in his message in Acts 3 to the prophets, to the scriptures. And he said, remember what Moses said, remember what Samuel said, and all the prophets said since the world began, they spoke of these days. And if you go back and read them and read what Peter's preaching, you see the fulfillment of those prophecies in Jesus' life, in Jesus' death, in Jesus' resurrection, and in the spirit-filled apostles in Acts 2 and 3. And so what we see is a fulfillment of prophecy. And so, again, just a review from last week, you need to pause there and think about that. If prophecy is being fulfilled in Acts 2 and 3, what is not there? The mystery kept secret since the world began. What is not there is the mystery church that the prophets didn't know about. Everything that's going on here is what prophecy said would happen. And that, thus the beginning of all the problems that people have concerning the church and what we're supposed to do and what we're supposed to preach. If you think the church is found here in the book of Acts and in Peter's ministry, then you think the church fulfills prophecy and think that prophecy is fulfilled in the church. And that's dangerous. Okay, dangerous for preaching the gospel, dangerous for what you think the church is supposed to be doing, uh, who do you think the church is, and your complete position in Christ. Okay? If you put yourself back under the prophetic program to Israel, uh, you will diminish your complete position in Christ and think that somehow you're lacking something. Because Israel was. Israel was lacking their kingdom, their covenant promise. Okay? So, meanwhile, that, that's all from last week. And so at the end of the uh, chapter, uh, if you remember in Acts 3, verse 23, Peter said that, remember what Moses said concerning this prophet that would come, and that's Christ. In verse 23, it shall come to pass that every soul which will not hear that prophet shall be destroyed from among the people. So not only is he preaching repent and then the kingdom will come, but he's preaching if you don't repent, then you'll be destroyed. Okay, so he's preaching judgment upon this nation that will not repent. So we now have the question faced to the nation and to us as we study, will Israel repent or not? That's the condition here. And it's what we're, we're looking for, is will they repent or not? If they will, the kingdom will come, as the prophet said, all Israel will be saved and the kingdom will come down. If they don't, then destruction comes. Okay? And so what we see in Acts 4 is the beginning of this response. Peter's posed the question. He's, he's preached to them. He's told them what they need to do. So in Acts 4 is now, what is Israel going to respond to the, these preachers, uh, to these apostles? And we see immediately that what happens is they start arresting them. They start trying to silence them. They start resisting the Spirit. And so the response is not positive. It's not one of repentance. Okay. So Acts chapter 4, verse 1, it says, As they spake unto the people, the priests and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them. And so we have a group of folks here, and all of these folks are the rulers, the leaders in the nation. And so although we've had a few thousand people in Acts 2, and we'll see later in this chapter, uh, 5,000 people were numbered. Um, we have thousands. It is not the whole nation that has repented. And more specifically, it is not the rulers of that nation. Okay? It is not the, the priests or those in the temple, the Levites, who are supposed to be speaking for God. They were God's priests. And so this, the kingdom would come uh, to Israel first, to Jerusalem first, to the priest in the temple first. That was the order, you see. And what we see here is a breakdown of that, where the priest and the, and the leaders and those in the temple are rejecting Christ. Right? Well, if the temple, which is the house of God, is rejecting 
God, rejecting Christ, then where is he supposed to go? You see, we have a fundamental problem here. And this is why we see the fall of Israel in the book of Acts. As they reject the Spirit, there's nowhere for Christ to go but away. You see, so he, he doesn't come back, and we'll cover that more later, but um, the apostles are rejected. Now, Peter and the apostles are going to the temple for that reason, if I can just add that on. Last week, I think, I think the title of last week's lesson was Peter in the Temple. No, that was two weeks ago, Peter in the Temple. And he's going into the temple because that's where they needed to be. Right. The temple, the, the priest, Israel, where they went to, uh, to, 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 to worship God, to do their religious uh, obedience to God, was where they needed to minister. Okay, that's where they were going to minister. So in Acts 4, verse 1, we have this group of priests, captains of the temple, which is like guards of the temple, part of the Levitical priests there, and the Sadducees uh, came upon them. You don't see mentioned here Pharisees, which is interesting. I'm sure there were Pharisees that resisted Christ, since there were that resisted him before. But you don't read very much about Pharisees after the resurrection opposing Christ, opposing the preaching of Christ. It's just interesting. Now, again, I'm not saying every Pharisee converted. But you read more about the Sadducees and the priests who were of the sect of the Sadducees. And you say, well, what's the difference? Well, Pharisees and Sadducees uh, were, were uh, to simplify it, denominations within Israel. It's an oversimplification. They were uh, groups within Israel that had a different perspective upon how you're supposed to interpret the law, you see. And so the Pharisees were those who would try to interpret the law quite literally. And as a result of that, um, they were very strict on your adherence to the word and letter of the law. And so they would raise questions about circumcision or to Jesus about the specifics of the law. Okay, they took it literally. Uh, also, their, one of their problems was that since they took it so literally and took the, 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 the rituals and the commands so specifically, they tended to add their own traditions to it. You know, these things that had to be performed before you were a true Israelite. The Sadducees were the other side of the, the doctrinal spectrum where they interpreted the law not so much literally and not so much um, in the sense that uh, we can derive from it uh, the teachings of resurrection and the teachings of a, a real Christ and a real earthly kingdom. Uh, they, they did not believe that. And so they were Jews. They believed uh, they were God's people. Um, but they were the liberals of the day. Okay, again, oversimplification, but that's how, how it was. And we see a definition in the Bible of the, the, the distinction between the two in Acts chapter 23. Look at Acts 23, verse 8. Sometimes you hear the word Pharisees, and you may think, well, Immediately, Pharisees are evil people. Well, not necessarily. It was true that in Jesus' earthly ministry, the Pharisees, there was Pharisees that resisted him, but there were also Pharisees that believed in him. Okay? Remember later, Paul said himself he was a Pharisee. Okay? And, the, and the Pharisees in Paul's trial against Israel actually supported him in some places. And that's on this issue in Acts 23. Acts 23, verse 8. It says, um, here's Paul's trial against Israel. And it says, uh, verse 7, when he, had, when he had so said, there arose a dissension between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the multitude was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection. Not just the resurrection of Christ, but there is no resurrection at all. They would say the law doesn't teach it, it doesn't happen, there is no resurrection of people, period. That's what the Sadducees taught. Okay. But the Pharisees, it says neither angel nor spirit, but the Pharisees confess both. So the Pharisees confess that there is a spirit, and there are angels, and there is a literal resurrection. And so you see, you would side with the Pharisees on this point, right? In this doctrinal point. And this, this, this battle between the Pharisees and Sadducees within Israel explains some of the reasons why things happen in the book of Acts and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay? So it's not that every time you see that word Pharisee, you think immediately hypocrite, or you think uh, you know, evil person. Well, no, these are the people who took the law, Literally, it may, may be of the same vein that you would have if you were a Jew in that time. The Sadducees were those who denied the resurrection, denied angels, that they even existed. Okay? So coming back to Acts 4, you see here priests and the captain of the temple, the Sadducees, came upon them. And it says in verse 2, they were grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And see, they were less concerned that they're preaching Jesus. I mean, there's lots of different groups preaching different people and different things. But it's that they were preaching so strongly that he rose from the dead. And that was their pet doctrine. That was what they could not, uh, t could, could not handle. Okay? And so that was one reason why they were aggrieved, is that when they preached Christ in heaven, that meant he rose from the dead. Okay? These are the same people, by the way. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 7, John the Baptist is water baptizing Israel. And the Pharisees and Sadducees come up, you know, some of them, and he calls them vipers, both of them. 
right? Because they're either self-righteous or denying the word of God. And so both of them were vipers. None of them were pre presenting works or the faith necessary to be water baptized by John, okay? In Matthew 22, 23, it tells us the same thing about the Sadducees. They did not uh, believe in the resurrection. But it's interesting to note, um, George Williams says in his commentary that before the cross, you find more of the Pharisees opposing Jesus in his manner and his teaching of the law. Okay, and, they're, and Jesus is teaching the law and they're, they're trying to trick him with the law. So when you see people come up and try to trick Jesus with the law, these are the Pharisees because they're, the they're the ones that are looking at the law specifically and trying to catch him at his words, right? And of course they can't. Jesus responds to them accurately according to the law every time. And you remember a few times he mentioned the sum of the law being to love God and then secondly to love your neighbor. Well, this was true. And so those lawyers back there said that well, he's right, you know, as if he needed their approval. You know, but these are the Pharisees back there. Okay. But then after the resurrection, what you read about is these Sadducees opposing the apostles because now they're preaching Christ raised from the dead. And so the Pharisees go, oh, well, we could, you know, these guys seem to be supporting what we believe against these Sadducees. You know, they're, they're on our side. So it's kind of like, you know, uh, the Christians and the Catholics today are both on the same side of the pro-life movement, you know, but they believe totally different things about what Christ did on the cross, right? The Catholics, you know, perpetually sacrifice Christ in their mass, and Bible-believing Christians who are saved think he died once for all and that we trust his finished work and we don't perpetuate the sacrifice. And yet, we'll hold hands about the pro-life movement, you know. And that's a similar perspective as it was, apart from the pro-life part, back with the Pharisees and the apostles who were preaching resurrection of Christ, okay? And so what you see, and I'm, maybe I'm getting out of the context here a bit, but it's interesting to think about that because in Acts 15, you see people in Peter's group who seem to deny that Jesus was really the Christ. They, they were followers of Jesus, apparently, or in Peter's group, but they were concerned about whether people were circumcised or not. And Paul calls them false brethren in Peter's group. Who are these people? I mean, how can you be in this group and you know, follow them around, be a part of this group, and, and you know, question some of the things they did about Jesus? Well, it may have been because of political motivations. It may have been because, hey, they preach resurrection, so do we, right? And so even though we disagree on some of the details about whether Jesus is the actual Christ, we do believe he rose from the dead, right? And they, and they kind of compromise on that point. And so they, they, were, they were commanding people to be circumcised, the Gentiles specifically in Acts 15. These were most likely Pharisees, okay? Uh, Sadducees would have been less concerned with that, I would think. So anyway, going back to Acts 4, just some things for your consideration there about these people and who they were. In Acts 4, verse 2, it's also interesting to see that they were grieved uh, which is an interesting spiritual application that when you stand for truth, as these people were standing for truth, the people that will be grieved are the religious ones. It does not say here the Romans heard them preaching and were so upset because they were preaching against their sins. You know, they could care less. You know, the, Ro the Romans here, they can care less. When Paul went to Jerusalem, uh, it was the Romans that actually protected Paul uh, against the Jews. It's the religious people like, that got all in a tizzy about what they were preaching, because it was against their doctrine. And take that as a lesson, even though you're not preaching the same thing as Peter, that when you take a persuaded, convicted stand for truth, it will not be the people who are apathetic about the Bible and who, who, who live in the world that will care about what you say. They could care less. It's the people who are in a religious system, people who have their own doctrinal agenda. You'll see them come out of the woodworks. And I think that's a good thing, okay? Hear me correctly. I'm not saying to, this to warn you, even though it will happen. But I think it's a good thing that people identify what it is they believe. Because then we can have productive conversation and evangelization about what the truth is. But when nobody talks about the differences, and we all think we believe the same thing, we're never going to talk about what we need to talk about. You know, where the battle lines are at. And so, here, here's Peter and the apostles. We'll see later in his response. He, he deals directly with the issues with these Sadducees, with these priests. He doesn't waffle. He doesn't beat around the bush. He just hits them right where they're wrong, right? And he, he doesn't try to compromise at all, okay? So we do need to stand for truth, but just keep in mind that it'll be re you'll receive religious opposition. You'll, you'll receive opposition from other Christians when you try to stick stand for right doctrine, okay? And, and that needs to be so. As Paul says, there, it's, it's manifest that there are heresies and wrong doctrines because people are standing for right doctrine in Corinth. You know, so there needs to be people with the courage to, to do that. Here we see in Acts 4 an example of Peter doing just that with these folks. In verse 3, 
it says these people, the Sadducees and priests, laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. So they arrested them is what's going on here. And they put them in the jail or in, in the room in holding. And in verse 4, Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. That would be the men doesn't include the women in this number, so there's probably a lot more than that. But 5,000 now is the size of the church in Jerusalem, the size of this group that believes Jesus is the Christ, which is significant to know what they're believing. Because you read in verse 4 here, many of them heard the word, believed. And a lot of people read verses like this, and they want to read into that verse, oh, they must have trusted Christ's death on the cross for their salvation and trusted his resurrection to give them eternal life, you know, as Paul preaches. We don't read anything about that. In fact, we don't read about anyone preaching the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ for salvation as good news, okay, uh, as, as a means of God's grace to the whole world before Paul. We don't find it. We haven't yet. Peter has preached the, the reality of his resurrection to sit in heaven to come back to reign as king on the earth. But he has not offered the death and resurrection as salvation. He's told them to repent and be baptized, right, and for the remission of sins in the name of Jesus Christ. And so in his power and his authority as the king, as the Christ. And so this word that they're believing is simply that he has raised from the dead. And why wouldn't they believe that? We've got these witnesses here. We've got these powers that are being manifested. We've got prophecies being fulfilled. And so they're believing that Jesus is the Christ because of the evidence of his resurrection. Okay? And so a lot of people, even today, a lot of apologists will, will, will start with that when they prove that Jesus is Christ. They'll start with the prophecies and start with the resurrection. And without belief in the resurrection, you are not a Christian at all, in any sense of the word. And so these people here definitely believed in the resurrection. They did not understand the resurrection according to the revelation of the mystery. Paul says later, Christ was raised from the dead according to my gospel in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Right? Well, what does that mean? Well, that would be a good study to perform. But there's the, an aspect to the resurrection that we only know because of what Christ revealed to Paul. Okay? They believed he resurrected, but why and what it accomplished, there's nothing else to that. Okay? So in Acts 4, they believed, and there were, the number was about 5,000, and it came to pass on the morrow that their rulers and elders and scribes, again, emphasizing here that they're bring, being brought forth before the rulers in Israel. Okay? The people are believing, not all the people, thousands are not the entire nation. There's probably a million or so in the nation. Um, but the rulers and the elders is who they're going to testify before. Okay? And in verse 6, it says, Annas the high priest and Caiaphas, remember Caiaphas from Jesus' ministry, and John and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem. So we have this council of men. Uh, historical side note that's interesting is that Luke here is listing the names of these people to the Theophilus. Apparently he knew them or he was aware of who they were. You don't start listing these names, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, unless the person reading it knows who they are, right? And so he's listing these, these people who are among the rulership or the wealthy or the, the, the aristocracy of, of Israel. And um, that tells us perhaps where Theophilus is at. Theophilus is the recipient of this letter, and he has probably traveled or knows of the people in these circles, okay? So anyway, we got this council here of Jewish leaders and gathered in Jerusalem, when they had set them in the midst, they asked, um, by what power or by what name have you done this? I think it's an amazing thing. The first question in this trial, this council that Peter and John are standing before, is, is not, what in the world are you guys doing? You know, it's not, explain to us from the prophecies what you're trying to say. It's, by what power do you do this? Where's your authority, is their question. You know, where's your authority to do what you do? Because they realize something. They realized it wasn't just teachers in Israel teaching a doctrine. This happened all the time in Israel. Different teachers would teach different things about the law and whatnot, and there'd be correction and whatnot. But here we have Peter and John, and they are with authority, just like Jesus did, preaching, and not only preaching, but preaching in the temple, which there were priests that already had authority there, and preaching against the rulers and against the, the, the unbelieving. Remember Peter said the untoward generation? And so they're preaching with this authority, uh, you know, casting down the authorities in Israel at the time. Okay? So they're saying, by what power do you do this? By, by, by what name have you done this? I mean, who has given you the authority to do what you're doing? Okay? And so they realize the affront, the threat, the attack 
on their own authority. We have the people who are in authority in Israel, and these guys are challenging them. Okay? And so I thought that's interesting, because back in John chapter 1, if you remember, this is exactly what these same guys, um, not all the rulers, but the Pharisees and Sadducees came to John, and they asked a similar question. They didn't ask John, what is this you're doing here, dunking people in water? You know, <laughs> they didn't ask this question. In John 1, 25, they asked the question, why? It says, why baptize thou then, if thou be not th that Christ, nor Elias, neither that prophet? They asked, why are you doing this? That's what they asked him. They knew exactly what he was doing. He was water baptizing people for the remission of sins. This is something Jews do even today. Okay? I, I've had people ask me before, because I've mentioned in my lessons, um, you know, was water baptism, is that a Christian thing or a Jewish thing? Well, historically, Christians have done it, but it's a Jewish thing. Before Christianity, Jews water baptized, and they do it today. Now, they don't call it baptism. That, that is a, a Christian word. Okay? From the Greek words and that sort of thing. But they do what Christians, or what the Bible says that they were doing, well, they, they did that. It was part of their law. Okay? Even today, uh, Orthodox Jews have what they call mikvahs. They're like ritual baths, where people go in at different times according to the law, and they immerse themselves in this water. And they come out, and they're ritualistically clean. Jews knew exactly what this was. And so when John the Baptist did this, they were asking, why are you doing this out here in the wilderness? We've got mikvahs, we've got these pools. You've heard of the Pool of Siloam and the Pool of Bethesda? That's what they did in those pools, right? We've got these pools over here, we've got the temple over here. Why don't you come over here? I mean, what, why? John the Baptist was a priest, remember? He was a Levite, okay? Why aren't you coming in here and doing it? Why are you out here in the wilderness and why are you dressed like that in camel's fur? And why are you doing it in this river, right? Of course, the whole point of that was John was calling them out from the wicked generation, saying, come out and repent, right? And he, so he was accusing the temple, which is why when these people from the temple came out, he called them vipers. You, know, you guys are wicked, right? And so immediately, John the Baptist is setting up a, a division. Jesus did the same thing in his ministry when he called those uh, scribes and priests who rejected him. He called them the vipers, he called them the snakes and the serpents, right? And so he did the same thing. He said, I come to bring division. And so the apostles in Acts 3 and 4 have done this as well. In their preaching, they have manifested Christ's resurrection through their explanation of the prophets and through the miracles they performed. Uh, but the leaders see this as an affront to their authority. And so they ask the apostles, by what power are you doing this? Right? Whose authority do you have? By what name? And of course, if you're Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, <laughs> this is a great question. What a great opportunity for me to preach my message again. You know, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, which is what he does, right? And he goes on and preaches that. Now, what they want to say, it, what, they're try, what they're also trying to do here is trying to get Peter and John, these fishermen, right? These, these unlearned and ignorant men, as the, the King James Bible says, to trip up, to say something wrong. Much like courts today, which people realize, if you know anything about the court system in our country, is somewhat of a mess, uh, that you can get caught up and trip over one of a million different laws and get unjustly accused or un unjustly sentenced or unjustly acquitted, you know, and it's just, where's the justice where people cry sometimes, okay? And it's just wrong. But what we have in, in Acts 4 is a similar thing. It's always been this way among uh, governments that are corrupt and that abuse the law, is that they're trying to trip these apostles, trying to get them to say something wrong so they can sentence them and punish them for what they're doing and thus solve their problem, okay? Remember, that's what they tried to do with Jesus, they wanted to stop his ministry by trying to catch him saying something wrong about the law. They could accuse him then and just stop his ministry. And that didn't happen until Jesus let it happen. When they let, him ca let them capture him, and then they crucified him. Okay? But in Acts 4, they're trying to do this with Peter as well. By what power? And if he says the wrong thing, ha, we got you. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll throw you up and crucify you. Now, this is also fascinating because Peter is the same guy who, when they captured Jesus and they took him away, wasn't he the one that ran away? I mean, all 12 guys ran away. But, you know, he kind of lagged behind, and when they asked him, hey, weren't you an apostle? Peter says, don't know him. Three times he denied him, right? So here's the guy who was fearing his life when they crucified Jesus, okay? And here, he is now standing before the same men that crucified Jesus, unashamedly, boldly proclaiming Jesus is the Christ. And I point that out because this is one of the evidences that the resurrection actually happened. Now, it's not the greatest evidence, because we've already covered the greatest evidences of the miracles and the prophecies and all that, the more sure word there. But one of the evidences that you hear the apologists give is that what happened to these men who were hiding 
and were ashamed of, or not ashamed necessarily, but in secret about this Jesus because they killed him. When they killed Jesus, the apostles fled. They were timid. But then suddenly in Acts 4, where's their shyness about this? What convinced them to now risk their lives? And in fact, many of them died because of them preaching Christ's resurrection, right? What happened? And of course, the only logical conclusion is that they were convinced that Jesus rose from the dead and were willing to die for the truth. Why would you die for a lie? Right? And so this is a pretty good evidence, uh, apologetically, that Jesus rose from the dead. What's more sure than just that apologetic is that the prophet said he would. And if you believe the Bible, the Bible says that Christ raised from the dead, and he did, and these people saw him. And so you have evidence in your scripture here. Okay. By the way, speaking of Christ's resurrection from the dead, the Sadducees, who had a, an invested interest in trying to, uh, to stop this preaching and this, this cult of, of, the, of the, uh, the Christ followers here, um, weren't they the ones who went to Pilate to get guards to guard the tomb when they killed Jesus so that the followers of Jesus wouldn't be tempted to lie about him being raised from the dead? Because they knew Jesus said, I'd raised from the dead in three days. So they said, we we're going to put some guards before that temple. And they did. They put guards before the temple. And they also, after his resurrection, when the guards said, we saw him raised from the dead, we saw the empty tomb, they paid them off. I got the verses on your outline there. You go back to Matthew 28. They paid off the witnesses and said, don't say anything about what you saw. Just say someone took the body. And it, it records they're paying them off. And so these are the people uh, who are here capturing Peter and the group and questioning their authority. We'll see again how, how they, this wickedness, this, this willingness to reject uh, God's word comes into their, their response to Peter. But um, we have in, in Acts chapter 2, or 4 rather, verse 7, they're asking, by what power you have done this? What's the name which you've done this? Um, turn back to Matthew 12. This is very similar to what they were accusing Jesus of when he was casting out devils. Do you remember? He cast out devils, and these, these folks were saying, well, he's doing this by the power of the devil. Acts chapter 12 and verse 24. When the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devils. And so the question in Matthew 12 was not whether or not the devils were being cast out. It was by what power Jesus was doing it. And they said, the only conclusion is that he's doing it with the devil, Right? Jesus had a great response for this because he knew their thoughts. And he says, well, a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. And you've heard that saying before. If he's doing it by the power of the devil and he's casting out devils, then you should be praising God because that means the devil's kingdom's not going to stand very much longer. Right? But his second uh, uh, reason to them is that uh, in verse 27, if I, if I by Beelzebub cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? You know, which is interesting. Apparently, there were people of, among the Jews who were ca trying to cast out this, these devils from these people. And, and Jesus says, well, they're doing it over there. So if I'm doing it by the devil, what are they doing it by? So now they're stuck because they're doing the same things that Jesus was, or trying to do, okay, about casting out devils, meanwhile. So it, this, it's the same thing that they're doing to the apostles here. They're, they're asking by what name, what power you're doing this uh, to get them to go on record for, for whom they, they are doing what they're doing, okay? If you look at Matthew chapter 7, it is possible to cast out devils and perform miracles in the name of Jesus and it not be God's will. So um, I read Matthew 12, and here you had the Pharisees who were against Jesus saying he did it of the devil. If you read Brother Stam's book on the Great Commission, uh, he talks about Mark 16 and churches today who falsely try to follow and, and claim the signs of Mark 16 who claim to cast out devils and perform miracles today. And uh, he says in his book that it may be that devils are allowing some of these things to happen if they're actually happening. And so we live in a spiritual world where there's spiritual warfare in which the devil, and the Bible says, has power to do things. In 2 Thessalonians 2, he has power to do signs and wonders and apparently to fill people to do miraculous things. Um, the miraculous being intervention by the supernatural or the spiritual. And so in Matthew chapter 7, I bring you to this part of the scripture where Jesus says in verse 21, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. 
So the, the key to getting to the kingdom of heaven, according to Matthew 7, 21, is doing the will of the Father. Okay, now verse 22, he says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. Now I'm sure he's mentioning this because there were people in Israel doing these things, in the name of God, performing these wonderful works. Okay, uh, none of them did the amount and the type of works Jesus did, but they were trying to do these works in the name of God. And of course, even today, people claim to do these sorts of works in the name of Jesus, in the name of God. And Jesus says here, in verse 23, Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. And so apparently, it's possible to do these things in the name of God, and you not be doing it according to God's will. All right? In Jesus' day, they should have received Jesus, believed in Jesus, and started doing what he was doing, what God said to, for him to do. If they were trying to do the things without him, which means trying to follow the law, trying to cast out the devils, without Christ, what does that mean? Well, they were not doing God's will, right? And they can claim, well, I'm trying to do God's law, and I'm trying to cast out the devils, which is against God. I'm on your side, God. And God says, no, you're not. You rejected my son, Right? And I, I, I want you to think about that, because as we bring it forward to 2015, we're not living in the time of Jesus' ministry, or the time of the apostolic signs, or the time of the kingdom, but we're living in this dispensation of grace. And the question on the table then would be, what is God's will today? Right? And if we understand God's will, if you're not doing God's will, what does that mean? Matthew 7, 21 says, if you're not doing God's will, Jesus said, I never knew you. And people boldly claim today to do things in the name of God and the name of Jesus, which are contrary to God's will today. And we know God's will, starting the Bible rightly divided, which should cause some concern. Okay, people go back to Matthew 7 and Matthew 12 and his earthly ministry and try to claim to do the things that Jesus did. And that's not what God's doing today. What does that mean? Okay, one, either they're being deceived by the devil, right? I'm not saying they saw the devil or signed a, con, a pact with the devil, but it's simply they're following the confused doctrines the devil would have them believe. Or secondly, they're just ignorant of God's will, which I think is the most common example. They don't know what God is doing. And so they read the Bible and they just try to do whatever God says anywhere to do in the scripture. And that's not good enough to just do anything what the Bible says anywhere, indiscriminately of who God said it to. Right? We didn't know who was speaking and to whom. Right? So... Going back to, to Acts chapter 4, um, when, when they're being questioned about these powers, these miracles that they have, they're legitimate questions. Okay? Of course, they're trying to accuse them and trying to catch them. But legitimate questions, and if they would only listen, going back to that phrase, if you have ears to hear, if they'd only listen to what Peter was saying and, and believe the message here, there would not be a problem. Okay? But of course, they don't. In Acts 4, Peter starts his defense in verse 8, filled with the Holy Ghost, is what it says, filled with the Holy Ghost. Um, that means something, by the way. This is not just something the writer of Scripture claims because Peter's on our side, and so everyone who's saved has the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 1.13. That's not what that means there. Acts 4, being filled with the Holy Ghost, is talking about the Spirit giving him words to speak. Now, pastors today and preachers today say the same thing. We've covered this before in Acts 2. Or well, they'll stand up and say, God's given me a word to speak. And they're liars. Okay? Because he hasn't. You say, how do you know that? I mean, you're not them. Well, you're right, I'm not them. But I can know by the words that come out of their mouth, which is contrary to what God gave Paul to preach and what he gave us to preach in the church. And so they go back and preach kingdom doctrine, saying, this is the fresh word from the Lord. The Lord's going to return last month. You know, <laughs> it doesn't happen. What, what do you say to someone who says, I got a word from the Lord, and the Lord was wrong? I mean, he didn't have the word of the Lord. Right? And so you can understand God's will from studying God's will rightly divided. So when Peter's filled with the Holy Ghost here, um, I also know that he's not speaking of his own mental calculation, but rather by the unction of the Holy Spirit, because that's what Jesus said would happen. Look, in Matthew chapter 10, he says this in verse 16. He says, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to the councils. And that's exactly what we see in Acts 4 a delivering of Peter and John to the council. And they will scourge you in their synagogues, and ye shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. So why would anybody invite people to come in to speak against them? You know, 
Well, they didn't invite them to speak against them. They arrest them. They take them before the council to try them, to put them on the defense. But Jesus says, instead, you'll testify against them. Instead of the defense, you'll be the offense, which we see what, that's what Peter does. He quickly, instead of being on the defensive, he takes it and makes it an offensive, preaching against these people, which shows some wisdom, folks. I mean, I don't know about you, I don't know if you've ever been in a courtroom. It's intimidating. Right. And it takes a lot of experience and a lot of knowledge and study to be able with confidence to stand in a courtroom and speak intelligently and being aware of the loopholes and the pitfalls. Right. But in Acts 4, here's this fisherman, not a lawyer. <laughs> and he stands before the councils, the learned men in Israel, and he speaks not only with authority, but accurately, without flaw and directly to the point that they needed to hear that they can't speak anything against him. OK. And Matthew 10 says the Holy Spirit's doing that. Matthew 10, verse uh, 18, 18, 19, there'll be a testimony against them and the Gentiles, but when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given you in that same hour what you shall speak. For it is not ye that speak, but the Spirit of your Father which speaks in you. So you see, Jesus said this would happen. That's how I know what Peter's saying there is not his calculation. It's not his sermon preparation. The Spirit gave him words to say there. Okay, they had no time to prepare. It's been overnight. Okay, in contrast to that, Paul says in Titus 1, we need to be taught the word and we need to study the word that we may be able to convince and exhort the gainsayers. All right. So they were given an unction of the spirit that he would give them the words to say in that same hour when they were persecuted. We're told you have a book, study it and learn and be equipped and be able. What happens if you don't study and are equipped? You're not going to have the right words. You're not going to know what the defense is. You're not going to know God's will. You're going to be flying blind. Okay, and you can make mistakes and you will make mistakes and you can't blame it on God, right? God, why didn't you help me? Well, you didn't study. You didn't do the work. These folks here didn't have the time to do the work. The Spirit gave them supernatural knowledge and gave them the words to say. So let's get to what he's actually saying in Acts 4. When he filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel. Oh, here it is. He's, he's so tactful. He's trying to appeal to their title. You know, he's trying to not be offensive to them, to which I, I laugh internally. <laughs> because if you hear what he's going to say next, it's just ridiculous to think that Peter is trying to not offend them. Okay. Peter says, ye, ye uh, rulers of the people, elders of Israel, and that's going to be a setup. Because if you're a ruler and elder of God's chosen nation, what ought you know? You ought to know who your Christ is. You ought to know what the law says. You ought to know what the prophets say. And Peter's going to accuse them of that. He says in verse 9, If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole? Which is the question they asked him. By what power do you do this? Do what? Heal that lame man over there? So we did a good deed by healing the lame man, and that's why we're standing here before you? So if we're being accused of doing wrong by doing a good deed, what does that make you guys? False accusers is what that makes. It. Peter takes the question, flips it back at him, and says, you guys are accusing me of doing evil when I was doing good. And Malachi says, woe to them who call good evil and evil good. And so, you know, Peter is accusing them now. They're on the defensive. He's the prosecutor. And he says, if we be this day examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all, rulers and elders of Israel, all the people of Israel, that by the name, again, that's the power, that's the authority, by the name of Jesus, and this is the second mention in that, that phrase, Jesus Christ. Christ isn't his last name. He was never, that was never something written on his birth certificate. That's a title that he's given because it's evident that he is the fulfilled Christ to Israel. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Nazareth part is his earthly birth, whom ye crucified. By what power do you do these things? By the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, by whom you killed. And you're falsely accusing me of doing bad. He says, even by him doth this man stand before you whole, whom God raised from the dead. So you killed him, God raised him from the dead. So what does that mean to these people who claim to be God's priests? They're working against God. You killed him, but God rose him from the dead, which means you're the enemy. You're the satanic ones. God is with Christ. Okay. And he says, it's by this man, by him doth this man stand here before you whole. And then he goes on in verse 11 to say, 
uh, this is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Now, what he's doing here is quoting prophecy. Psalm 118, 22 and 23, where it says this very thing, okay, that the stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. Okay, and he, he says that the stone is Jesus, which was set at naught of you builders. Now, this is past tense. This is past tense. The stone has already been set at naught by the builders. Right? When did that happen? When, when did the stone get set and re, being rejected by the builders? It, it was when Jesus came and they killed him. Okay. Look at Matthew 21, verse 43. It's important to know when this happened because you'll start to identify when Israel stumbled and when they fell. We talk about Israel stumbling and falling, and maybe we need to ask, over what did they stumble and fall? Well, the answer is given in Scripture multiple times. They stumbled and they fell over that stone, which prophecy talks about, that stone being the rock of Christ. Christ is that stone. They, they stumbled over it. The same stone Daniel talks about that would destroy the kingdoms of the world. Matthew 21, verse uh, 41. <clears throat> Jesus here is quizzing the uh, priests and scribes here. And he's asking them what would happen if, uh, you know, uh, the, the wicked servants did not keep the vineyards and that sort of thing, what would they do? And it says in verse 41 that he will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen, which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. So they condemned themselves with their words here. And Jesus says, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you. Who's he talking to? Scribes? priests, rulers. It shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. Well, who's bringing forth the fruits? It's going to be Peter. It's going to be that little flock. It's going to be the people of Pentecost who perform the miracles, right, who are preaching by authority, who are given authority by the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Jesus says here, the kingdom is being taken away from you. In Luke 12, 32, Jesus says that it's the Father's good pleasure to give you, talking to the disciples, little flock, the kingdom. He calls them the little flock. They're little because it's not the whole flock of Israel. It's they're a little flock. There's a remnant of believers. And so I bring this up because um, Jesus mentions the same prophecy that Peter does. Jesus says, you sh it shall be taken from you. Right? When they crucified Christ, that was their stumbling. And they were stumbling. And at Pentecost, in Acts 4 and 5, what we're going to see is their fall. Because Jesus preached to them. They killed him. They stumbled over the stone. Peter preaches the stone to them again, and it makes them fall. I mean, they do not accept it. They don't recover from the stumble. They fall, you see. And so that's what's going on here in Acts 4. He quotes the same prophecy to them. Uh, Paul quotes the prophecy as well in Romans chapter 9 and when he's explaining what happened to Israel. In Romans chapter 9, verse 32 and 33, Paul says, uh, Why did Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, did not receive righteousness? And he says, Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith but as it were by the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. And he quotes, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whosoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. That's Isaiah 28. So Peter says, or Paul rather, that the reason why Israel didn't receive the righteousness they were promised because they did not, you know, they did not by faith receive the stone. They stumbled over it. All right? That's why Israel fell. And he describes that in Romans 11, that they fell. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2 where Peter wrote an epistle. The same Peter we're reading about in Acts 4. And the same Peter writes about the stone once again. So this is an important topic and a good study for you to perform about how and when Israel stumbled over the stone. Uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 6 through 8, he writes, uh, verse 5, Ye also as lively stones, remember he's talking here to the believers who are scattered, the believing remnant of Israel, you as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it, contained, it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believes on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But to them which, is, which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. He goes on to explain that you're the chosen generation, you're the holy nation. Peter's audience in 1 Peter is the same believing group in Acts 2, 3, and 4 that was the chosen nation, the holy nation, the chosen generation, the royal priesthood, 
And the people who were believing there, they were the people in Israel. They were the fishermen. They were people believing. The rulers didn't believe. The priests didn't believe. The Sadducees didn't believe. And so Peter's calling people who are not priests in the sense that they're in the temple in Israel. He's calling them priests. You're the true priests. So what's that mean for the priests that are actually in the temple, the priests in charge of the council? They're, they're cast away. They're fallen. They've rejected it. And so see, that's the, that's the authority battle that's going on there. Peter is, is claiming that this church is what's going into the kingdom and that those people in the temple are not going to get it. Okay? So that's why they're having this council. And, and when Peter responds to them in the power of the Spirit, they can't respond back because they realize um, he's speaking with such authority and with truth that the, you know, the Spirit's words can't be resisted here, which just shows their wickedness because they don't repent when they hear it. Look at Acts chapter 4 then. It brings us to a verse which is oft quoted by people when talking about salvation because uh, it uses the word. Peter says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's interesting here that it points out that salvation is here to the group. We must be saved. Right? So when he's preaching to these lost leaders of Israel, he says, There's no other name whereby we must be saved. Uh, the nation. According to prophecy, Israel needed to be saved in order for the kingdom to come. And he says the name that's going to get that done is the name Jesus Christ of Nazareth. That's the name. The name Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus Christ. Okay. There's no other name under heaven, which is interesting because um, Jesus also said, I am the way and the truth and the life. So if Peter is trying to appeal to them here and saying, look, guys, let, let, let me just explain to you, walk you through here step by step. Well, no, he says, listen, I preach Jesus Christ, you killed him, you're guilty, you stumbled over the stone, and Jesus Christ is the only way you're going to be saved. And you try preaching like that today, and you're accused of being a fundamentalist, and you're accused of being confrontational and offensive in your approach. And that's what Peter did, right, when he was confronting the council. Granted, he was not preaching the gospel we preach, but you see the tactic here that's, that the Spirit is performing in him, Okay. So there is no other name. That verse also is a pretty good proof of Jesus' deity because in the Old Testament, Isaiah 43 and 45 says there's only one God and one Savior. There's only one Savior. And it's the Lord, capital L-O-R-D, Jehovah God, is the Savior. Well, here, there's no other name whereby uh, under heaven, given among men, whereby we must be saved, except for Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Jesus Christ is the Lord of the Old Testament. Right? He, he's, he's that Savior back there. So, pretty good study there as well. But Peter's not apologetic to these guys. He's uh, preaching boldly at them. And that's what it says in verse 13. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. They marveled. Okay, this is not something where Peter and John <clears throat> had been granted certificates and degrees and were esteemed among the people. By the way, that's different a little bit than Paul. Okay, Paul... Oh, uh, was learned, right? Some people say that's the reason why we find so much doctrinal explanation in Paul's epistles, because he was learned. You don't find it back here with Peter because they just weren't that learned. Which, uh, again, I, I kind of tip my head at because, yes, they weren't learned, and yes, they were ignorant men, and yet the Spirit was giving them words. And they were marveling of the things that they said because they were unlearned and ignorant. And so the Spirit was giving them words to say. Okay? And it says in verse 13, a condemnation here of uh, these folks who heard it. They, they saw the boldness of Peter and John, which, by the way, boldness there doesn't mean that they were wildly, you know, jumping up and down. That's not the type of boldness that they saw. I mean, go back and read the words. You don't have to be flamboyant to be bold. Sometimes being bold is what you say, not just how you say it. It's what you say. And you can be direct and plain and, and, and be bold that way. You know, uh, a lot of people tell me stories about the, the children in the back and how when they learn the truth of the gospel and the truth of what's right, sometimes they just kind of just say it, right? That's called boldness. <laughs> uh, if they're right, they're right. And if they say it, then it's right. You know, what's wrong with saying it? And people say, well, it can cause offense and cause problems. Well, <laughs> whose fault is that? I mean, what's the problem there? You know, th there's boldness here. And in verse four, chapter 4, verse 13, Peter does this, that, and they marvel at it. And they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. That last phrase, 
means that they acknowledged that what they said was evidence, and what they did was evidence that they had been with Jesus. Apparently, these guys weren't refusing that they saw Jesus, that he rose from the dead, but they don't care, you see. They don't care about what they saw or what the prophets said or who they are stumbling over the stone. What they care about is having control over this nation and you're a, a, an affront to our control. They'll say so much here in a few verses. Okay, Just like before when Jesus was performing the miracles and they met together and what they said in John 10 and 11 was, or John 11 was that this guy does many miracles. What are we going to do? They didn't deny the miracles. They said, what do we do? Because he's getting a following. He, he's a threat to our power and our control. And they said, well, we're going to kill him. And why? Because it's better that we kill him and we be in control of the nation than let him continue and him take over. You see? So they did it for, it was a political struggle. They rejected their king back then, and they're rejecting him here. They don't care what they say. They don't care if they're right. They don't care if they saw Jesus resurrect from the dead. They don't care. Okay, they're going to be in control of this kingdom, or this, this, this nation of Israel under Roman rulership, okay, was, if it's the last thing they do even if it means rejecting their Messiah. So next, 4 verse uh, 14. They beheld the men which was, stand, standing, uh, which was healed, standing with them, which tells you, I think it was a question last week or a couple weeks ago, whether the, the lame man you know, became part of Peter's group or not. We don't find anywhere where he was water baptized, which I think was the question, but here it says he was standing with them. So he, he was on their side. He, he was the evidence. And Peter's going, look, that guy, 40 years old plus, he was lame his whole life. Everybody knows it, right? Look at him now, doing jumping jacks, right? That, that was the evidence. So he's standing with them, and they could say nothing against it. There was nothing they can do to speak against the miracle that had happened. So they weren't saying, you didn't do the miracle. They saw it. They were questioning the power by which they did it. You know, you can't do it in the name of Jesus. You know, do it in the name of, of God, of, of the Lord, you know, the generic God. Sing Amazing Grace. It doesn't mention Jesus. That's the best song that people love to sing in church, is Amazing Grace. Most popular song. And you hear Amazing Grace being sung in the Super Bowl or whatever, and then people say, oh, great, it's a Christian song. Christ isn't mentioned once. The death isn't mentioned once. The cross isn't mentioned once. Very unoffensive song. An amazing song for those of us who know what grace means. But it's not an evangelistic song. I'll tell you that. Because it doesn't have the gospel in it. It just, it just praises God for his amazing grace. But another topic for another day. Acts chapter 4, Peter here is... is, um, is after he preached here, that they cannot resist, they cannot say anything against what miracles they've done. Verse 15, when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves. So they go back and have a little committee meeting here about what they're going to do. Okay. And they say, what shall we do to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem. And we cannot deny it. What are we going to do? They've done a miracle. Everybody's seen it. The cat's out of the bag. More people are believing. What are we going to do? In verse 17, the conclusion is that it spread no further among the people. Let us straightly threaten them that they speak henceforth to no man in this name. What? You think if you're presented with undeniable evidence and prophetic scriptures and the boldness of these unlearned and ignorant men, obviously followed the Holy Spirit, you would say, maybe we ought to listen to these people. And yet they don't. Instead, they say, we can't let this continue. Let's threaten them so that people will also learn, you know, not to speak in this name. Okay. In verse 18, they called them and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. We are the authorities. We are the religious law. This is what you're going to do, is what they say. You're not going to speak in the name of Jesus. And Peter goes, we're going to appeal. We're going to take it to a higher court, you know. Well, no, he doesn't say that at all. Okay, he, he doesn't appeal to them at all. In fact, he rejects their authority. In verse 18, in verse 19, it says, Peter and John um, answered and said unto them, Whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you more than unto God, judge ye. So Peter, <laughs> the boldness here is amazing. He's not sitting there and they, they give their sentence. You know, okay, you know, just don't speak it anymore. We, 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 we're going to threaten you with jail time, with death, if you continue in this way, Right? And Peter goes, I don't even recognize by what authority you do what you're doing. You try that in court, you get thrown in jail real quick, right? Yeah. If you go to court and the judge goes, you know, well, what authority did you do what you do, breaking that law? And you go, I don't recognize your authority, judge. He'll hold you in contempt, you get thrown in jail, and that's the end of that, right? These guys will eventually get in jail for doing that. 
but this day they're not. That's exactly what Peter says. He says, whether it be right in the sight of God to hearken unto you, judge ye. These are the priests in Israel. What did God say about the priests in Israel? They, they were the leaders in Israel. God gave the priests authority. He made the Levitical priests, those in the temple, the spokesmen for God. And they're telling him not to speak in this name. They're the scribes of the law. They're the teachers of the law. And Peter says, you judge whether it's right in the sight of God for me to obey you. Well, what does that mean? Peter says, I don't recognize any authority that you have to tell me to do this. Wow. And he says in verse 20, <clears throat> well, before we go on, I need to speak about this here because this verse, and we'll see another one in chapter 5, is used by a lot of people to, to live a subversive and rebellious life against all authority. And they do it because they quote this verse in 1 chapter 5 that says, we'll obey God more than men. Okay? We need to keep in mind the context here. Right? You are not Peter. You do not have the authority on earth over anyone like Peter did. You say, well, how is that different? Surely you should obey God before men. Well, I understand we should obey God before men, but God also instructs us how to live when we're under Gentile, pagan, unbelieving authorities. Okay? So there is a teaching about we as ambassadors and how we live on this planet. And it's not according to what Peter was doing here. Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, wasn't just filled with the Holy Spirit and represented the church, and these guys represented the government, and they were battling between the church and government authority. No. Peter was representative of God's nation of Israel. You understand? These rulers... They were representative, but they stumbled over that stone, remember? And what did Jesus do? He gave the, took the kingdom from them, the kingdom, the dominion, the authority from those guys, and gave it to a righteous nation. Who did he give it to? Twelve apostles. Remember Matthew 19, 28? Matthew 19, 28, he turned to his apostles who asked him, what will we get? And he said, you'll get twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. That's not deaconship. That, that's thrones. That's authority over a nation on the planet. He took these fishermen and elevated them to a position of rulers in Israel. And they're walking around just like they were. People know them as fishermen, but Jesus Christ gave them authority. And so they, by the authority of Jesus Christ, quite literally, have become the judges of the nation of Israel. And so they walk up into this council and he goes, by what authority do you do what you do? And they're going to say, we're the priests. I mean, read the law. And Peter's going to say, yeah, read the law. They speak of Christ. And Christ, because you denied him, gave authority to us. Wow, that's a political battle right there. Now, you, as a member of the body of Christ, have no authority to say that. You're an ambassador here. That doesn't mean we acquiesce to wrong and that we say we shouldn't speak about wickedness in the world. Okay, we're not representatives of God. But we are not citizens of an earthly kingdom. We're not trying to build a kingdom. And we haven't been given authority in an earthly kingdom. We are ambassadors sent from a heavenly place to preach a message of reconciliation from God. Now you say, well, the world's going to reject that. We need to fight for laws. Well, yes, the world's going to reject it, but that's what you're supposed to represent. God's grace to a world that's rejected him. Okay? You trying to accomplish and rebuild the kingdom as Peter was going to do here, lead this into this kingdom, is not what God is doing today. Right? And so our response to the authorities of the world, whether it be American authorities or whatever authority, is different than Peter's response to the authorities in Israel. He was telling them, you have no more authority in Israel. God gave it to us. Okay? We say we're saved by God's grace. We're his ambassadors pleading and beseeching you to be reconciled to God because he's going to come back and judge the whole, name, the whole world. That's our message. Okay? You say, what about the laws of wickedness? Well, they've been wicked for 2,000 years. And God is no longer, in this dispensation of grace, establishing a nation anywhere on the planet. Okay? Praise God that we have the privilege of living in a country that had so many people who gave emphasis to the Bible at one point that we have remnants of liberty and freedom and righteousness that, 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 that God would ascribe to things like that. But we have no obligation or, or, or a special election as a nation from God. We have none of that. Okay? So we, we, as proper citizens of, of God's body, members of his body, take a stand for righteousness. And yet more priority than that is our authority and our command to preach the gospel to people, to see souls saved and saints edified. So we need to understand what God has told us to do, going back again to knowing God's will. All right? What is our final authority? All right? In Acts chapter 4, 
Peter appeals to God as his final authority and Jesus Christ specifically as giving them authority over the nation. In verse 20, Peter says, we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. The things which they have seen and have heard being what? Jesus the Christ in his earthly ministry, confirming the promises made to the fathers, him having given authority to Peter and the apostles, him going to heaven and leaving, bestowing authority on his apostles, right? Peter being that apostle, we saw Jesus, we heard the teaching from him, and he's learned from the law and the prophets what God is doing. We cannot but speak. And so there's some good preaching in that verse, which I don't have time for. Do it to yourself, please. We cannot but speak, Peter says. We cannot but speak. Nothing, we cannot but speak. He has to do it, he says. We cannot not speak. He can't be silent, is what he's saying. And so you have the same position, by the way. Now, I'm not talking here about the message or what he's doing, but the idea that you've been given a message to communicate. And if you think it's okay not to speak, you don't get it, right? You should be in a position where you understand God's will and want to do God's will to do his ambassador. You cannot but speak what he's told you to speak from his word rightly divided, right? And yet many people justify their silence thinking that, well, it won't do anything. It doesn't matter if it does anything. You're to make all men see the fellowship of the You're supposed to speak. And that's what Peter was supposed to do here, too. We cannot but speak. What he was speaking, the things that he saw and heard, the things that he saw and heard according to prophecy, what we're to speak boldly are the things concerning the mystery of Christ. In Ephesians 4 and Ephesians, or Colossians 4 and Ephesians 6, Paul says to pray for me that I may, my, I may open my mouth boldly to speak the mystery of Christ speak the mystery of the gospel. And that should be your prayer, because I, I know it takes courage. <laughs> it takes courage, uh, but that's what we're supposed to do. We, in Acts 4, is all about boldness. Will it be the boldness of the Spirit-filled Peter? We'll cover next week the boldness that, that comes upon the rest of the apostles, the rest of the, the disciples there, and they speak with boldness. We need boldness. We need people to encourage our boldness, but we need to speak. We need to be in a position where we cannot but speak the truth. And we're trying to do that here. We're trying to do it through the, the tracks and the books and we, the radio program and the fairs and things that we do. But you, you need to, in yourself, be motivate, motivated by God's word, by his spirit to, to, to put yourself in those positions. Okay? Verse 21, when the council had further threatened them, <laughs> they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them, even if they could punish them, even as they will kill them. What did Jesus say to them, to the apostles? Don't fear them that can kill the body them that can kill the body and the soul, right? They knew who their authority is. They know Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and there's nothing these people can do against them that will prevent them from speaking, right? Peter doesn't even recognize their authority. So he says they let them go. What a sham that is. They arrest them. They hold a council. They accuse them. They get accused in, in response. They threaten them twice and let them go. <laughs> Did they do anything wrong? They couldn't find anything to punish them over. Apparently, they didn't do anything wrong. And it says that they let them go, finding nothing how they might punish them. Look at those four words there. Because of the people. For all men glorified God for that which was done. The healing of the lame man. When you're motivated by the mob, by people, okay, that's how you're going to make their decisions. They're going to run you. They're going to rule you. When you're motivated by people, and not by what God has told you to do, you're going to be ruled by people, okay? And so you read this, and the only reason why the council let them go, they probably would have killed them or something, if it weren't for the people. And you could say, well, thank God for the people. It doesn't matter whether the people were there or not, right? It, it mattered the wickedness here of the, this council, and that they weren't following God. They weren't trying to consider what God was doing here. They were only considering their political convenience, and saw that we cannot kill them, we cannot keep them, the people would hate us, right? Just like back with John the Baptist. They didn't want to say that he wasn't of God because the people wouldn't like it. Why don't you speak the truth, you cowards? Right? And that's what Peter's saying here. So in verse 22, for the man was above 40 years old on whom the miracle healing was showed. And so it was obvious to all this miracle had been done. It was obvious to more people that uh, Christ, Jesus was the Christ, and they were believing. And here we have Peter and John arrested, brought before the council, speaking by Holy Spirit utterance, and let go. And it's going to be a means of glory for this church in Jerusalem here, that God has provided this response and this salvation, quite literally, from the hands of those that persecute them. 
Okay? We'll see it again in the next chapter as well. Any, any questions, any comments about Acts 4, those first 22 verses there? Explain the term head of the corner. The rock is the head of the corner. Does that mean a cornerstone? Of the... Yep. Okay, that's good. Yep. There, there's two ways people interpret that. Um, well, it's stated that way several times in the Bible. Yep, yep. The, the head of the corner, the cornerstone, the thing by which the whole building is measured by. And if you know architecture and construction, when you build a building, there's, there's that beginning foundation has yeah. to be laid and then all the buildings built on top of it. And so there's two ways people have described it. If you're building a square building like this, there's a cornerstone here that will tell you, you know, the directions, you know, how it's gonna be oriented. So that cornerstone is important to get right or else this wall is gonna be wrong, that wall is gonna be wrong. So you need to get that cornerstone right, okay? The other way some people, I know Clarence Larkin talked about it like this, is they drew a cornerstone like this, where it's a pyramid, and that stone in the top was the cornerstone. And there's reasons why they describe it that way. But again, this way, that cornerstone would determine how the walls are built. You know, I, I think it's more than this vertical thing, but nonetheless, it's the cornerstone. The, impo the important part, the stone is the important stone from which the rest of the building is built on. And so the, the stone came to build up this kingdom the builders of the kingdom should have been the rulers and priests in Israel that would have received their king, and the builders stumbled at the stone. They could not build anything because then the cornerstone was given them, they stumbled over it. So that's the idea of prophecy. Who received the stone? Well, First Peter writes about that, that, lim, that little flock, the remnant. They're the ones that believed in, in the stone. So, any other questions? Yeah, that stone is why Israel stumbled at the cross, and why they fell with the, uh, the apostles, and why by the time you get to Romans 11, uh, Paul <coughs> says Israel's fallen because they stumbled over that stone. They rejected it. All right. Anything else? Lord, we thank you for your word, and thank you for your church. I pray that uh, we would have the boldness to speak as Peter spoke knowing, of course, that you're not empowering us like you did with them. You have given us your spirit, and you've given us the power of the gospel and given us the power of your word. May we study it and put it within our souls so that we live accordingly and be able with boldness and compassion to speak to people about the truth, uh, to deliver them out of uh, the errors that, they, that they're being led into or the confusions that they have or just the peace they've been robbed of. I, I, there's a need for what, what your word says rightly divided, and I pray that more people would be willing to do the work. And we thank you for those that do. Amen. Thank you, folks.